Hello and welcome to the Winners Find a Way show. I am your host, Trent Clark, CEO of Leadershipity, serial entrepreneur and entrepreneur organization member. I am a global speaker, dazzling audiences in 17 countries already. And most people know me, though, besides the host of this show, as a longtime coach in professional baseball coaching in three World Series. Also, hey, man, new author, Tom Coverley. I'm a new author here. Yeah, on look at that. Leading, winning teams, Ooh. all fired up about my book with Wiley coming out soon. But today on the Winners Find a Way show, special treat, kindness, wins, Tom Coverly, what's up, my man? Oh, man. Yo, great to be on the show. And congrats on the book, man. I'm so just, I didn't uh, that might have been on. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Tom, before we go, tell people where they can find you. Absolutely. So if they go to TomCoverly.com, they can find just every bit of information about me. Boom. TomCoverly.com. Check it out. Kindness Wins is most of the handles for Tom Coverly. This guy has done it all. On uh, man, you've been around the world. You're a Jersey boy, you know. Yeah. Not not to be confused with the musical, by the way. He doesn't probably personally, you know, know you know the I, band. Yeah. <laughs> that is too funny. Yeah. By the way, what a great show, man. Jersey boys, like love it, man. I had no idea that I knew so many Frankie Valley songs. By the way, That's and true. and then you you're now in residing in Pensacola, Florida, lovely wife, Tiffany, who also is a superstar, author of Confidence, yeah. incredible book, done seven years now into a blended family, two adult children. You got a 12 year old now, you mm -hmm. two raising this girl up right. And man, tell, tell us a little bit about your venture with Kinder Candies, because like little Annie's like right in the hotbed of entrepreneurship right now. She is, she is the little boss sitting right here, man. So Kinder oh, Candies, Eat sweet, be sweet, man. That's our that's our motto. And right. so we want people to eat sweet and be sweet. But Annie, if you can see on there, it says that she is the boss, man. And so it's a way for me, man. I started doing it. I'm busy, like you're busy. But it's a way that not only as a side hustle, it's not about that as much as teaching my girl about entrepreneurship, man. Yeah. I want to teach her all the ins and outs. So when I was doing the LLC, when I was doing the packaging, I'm doing the labeling on the back, all the legal terminology that's got to be on it. I want to teach her every little bit, man, so that someday she can go, look, I can make money anyway, right? I can find something to buy market. And so that's why we're trying to do some free strike candy. I love it. Like uh, you and I, we have something majorly in common. We're homeschool families. So we mm -hmm. raised our children up with a different type of education. My wife has spun off a business out of her homeschool training where awesome. she online trains called Zoom through Latin. And she does online training of Latin training. And wow. of course now, yeah, it's crazy. And it's incredible how good she is at this thing. And man, I love the idea when kids are coming in, like entrepreneurship, handling money, marketing, customer service, branding, how this works, time management, fulfillment, like, right? Hey, hey we got a uh, shelf life now. We got to get these in these many stores, package it up, baby. Like, mm -hmm. this is, again, and no one else is coming to help, man. Like, you've got to get it done. Yeah, that is it. And we're, we're, I've been working around the clock on this in this last week since I got home from tour. So we're, we're just trying to get this stuff out there and, and do it, man. But it, yeah, it's a lot of work, but I, again, I just think she's a little viral sensation herself. And yeah. so I just thought every time she does a video, it seems to go viral. She's already got a couple viral videos out there. One, when the Philadelphia Eagles, me growing up in New Jersey, I grew up on the other side of the bridge from Philadelphia. So when the Eagles won the Super Bowl. She did a video for the players and for the fans. And so that thing went beyond viral, man. So Philadelphia players reaching out to her and she was doing interviews left and right with major networks and it was just incredible. So, and then another time she was singing on the diving board, man, with a pool skimmer, she was skimming the pool and she was standing on the diving board using the end of the pool skimmer as a microphone and she was belting out alicia keys this girl's on fire and yeah. so the keys reached out to her she did good morning america access hollywood there were 
bucks at her house for a month straight of interviewing her. So th this whole thing, over 10 million views on this video, man. Just wow. So the boss, man, if I can, if I can get yeah. her to it learn like, now. It sounds like partnership program. For life. That's all I'm hearing. I'm hearing partner programs, Philadelphia Eagles. Let's partner up with Kinder Candies. Let's get them in the stadiums. Let's get this oh, thing rolling, man. people, because the Eagles know. are front runners anyway, man. Yep. They they know how to trend set it, and I don't know if I've ever seen a more loyal fan base, right? Like these folks are gaga in Philly, and I love it and yeah. hate it at the same time. Yeah, the I know, room. I know. So, so I, you've got now what what a lot of people don't know about you is started out as a youth pastor, built this magic. And man, you you are just got a heart for kids. You are speaking to schools all over the world. You got a great TV show called Influenced NFL NCD No Vowels, and that's a really cool show you can see on Connect TV. And man, you 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 are always staying busy. But what most people may not know about you, Tom, is that you know in your younger days, you were arrested, <laughs> and not just anybody. Oh no, no. Tom Coverley was arrested by the Secret Service. You know, yeah, yeah. these are the people who guard the president. Just to be clear about who the Secret Service uh, is. So TC, by the way, TC show today, Trent Clark, Tom Coverley. So we got TC squared. And tell them a little bit about how that thing went down. Yeah, man. So I, I was actually, it wasn't in my like super younger days, but I was like fresh out of college. I was brand new at this youth pastor thing. And I had not seen some of my buddies that we graduated with for, you know, a couple years now because everybody went into their youth pastor roles. And so there was a giant youth convention in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And so that's where we were linked up. There were probably about 4,000 youth pastors there at this thing. A session just got out. I'm in the lobby. And next thing you know, man, we're huddled in a circle, just chatting. One of my professors is there and my buddies are all there. And next thing you know, I have two Philadelphia police officers grabbing my arms, but I look over and there was these two like sharp looking dudes in like their suits and my glasses. Oh, yeah. you guys stay done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, their little earpieces in and and just start escorting me out right in front of everybody. And I look over and my my buddy who him and I used to get in trouble in college a lot with, you know, just stupid fun. Right. But we we're just the pranksters on the college campus. And so he's given a look like I think he's up to this. Like, I think this is a joke. Like Matt, Maddie put me up to this. So oh. I'm thinking this whole thing's a joke. So keep that in mind. Yeah, you're waiting for Ashton Kutcher. Like, am I being punked right yeah, now? Exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, I'm in the lobby. Four thousand youth bastards. Everybody's in the lobby. Everybody's witnessing this, right? And so I get escorted out right before we go out the door. I stop them. I'm, I'm like, hey, I'm not going out the door with you guys. Again, I'm thinking this is a joke. I'm not going out the doors with you guys. I said, yeah, that, that's a great suit you got there. And you guys are nice uniforms, nice police officer uniforms. They look really real, you know? And I said, can I see a badge from you two guys? And they're like, you don't need to see our badge. And I said, no, I would like to see your badge. And so they pulled out, do you know what we do? We're the secret service. And so they're rattling off all this stuff. And I'm like, all right, this will be fun. Let's go. Right. And they're like, man, this guy is just cocky. Like, but I'm yeah. only being cocky because I thought it was a joke. Yeah. So they take me around the backside of the building. We go down these steps of this big hotel, the Marriott or whatever I think it was downtown. We go down. Now we're in like the security room area and there's security guards all down there looking at all the cameras and everything throughout this big hotel. They put me in a room and the police officers leave. Now I'm in the room being interrogated by two secret service agents. And so make a long story short, man, they asked me the same several questions over and over again for probably 30 plus minutes. And it was like literally something out of a TV show minus like the light above my head where they're hitting it. Like, where were you at? You know, yeah. I, I was just interrogated so much. And 
them just they were thinking i was just lying man just completely yeah. lying they're looking at my uh, wallet they're going through grabbing my license out they're looking through the money in my wallet and i'm like what is going on i said and i kept asking like what's going on and they said just answer our question i mean they're just straight yelling at me and and i was getting a little nervous eventually but at first again i'm thinking as a joke so they're like what did you buy in the hotel and I'm like, nothing. The hotel's too expensive. I've been going down the street and grabbing a cheesesteak, you know? So they're like, I said, oh, you know what, guys? I did put a dollar in the soda machine one day, you know? And they were not liking all these cocky responses. And so now about 20 minutes into this, this is when I start realizing this thing is not a joke. These guys are dead serious. And I yeah. hear them eventually pausing. They're going to the door. They're communicating with the people outside the door. And I'm like, there's something big time going on here. And so, and now at this point, when I get nervous, man, I want, I want to go to the bathroom, man, as fast as possible. And so, and, and drop one of these. Right. And so <laughs> I, I'm getting re really nervous at this point. And so they're basically just asking me who I am. What's my name? And I have a badge around my, my neck, man, that says youth pastor, Tom Coverly, right? And I'm yeah. like, I'm a youth pastor. And they're like, that's not your name. What's your name? What are you doing here? And again, asking these questions. And then finally, I hear a lot of commotion going on with them watching the TV monitors outside the room. And they're like, we're about to go into his room right now. And we're entering. Oh, and they're naming the stuff that they're like, they found weapons in there. And I'm thinking, this is in my room. This is not yeah. my room. And they're finding some drugs and, and things in there. And so um, next thing you know, you get a knock on the door. The police officers come in and they call the guys out. I'm sitting in the room by myself and I'm trying to like eavesdrop, all right, and listen as close yeah. as I can. And then next thing you know, not the police officers, not the Secret Service, they didn't come in. Um, the security guys from the hotel come in and they sit me down and they're like, Mr. Coverly, we apologize. This was a case of mistaken identity. The Secret Service have been following one of the biggest counterfeiters in the country around. And you happen to look just like this guy. The hotel was warned that he was somewhere in this hotel. And so they've been on the look for this guy and you happen to match it perfectly. And so we are so sorry. You're free to go. At this point, I'm like, hey, look, am I, I go, I got to go to the bathroom really, really quick. And they're like, listen, anything that you need, if you need a limo ride here, if you want a free, and I'm like, I don't want nothing right now. I just want a bathroom. So I go up to the bathroom. I go out, talk to all my friends, my college professor. They're all laughing their heads off. Like what happened, you know? And, and so I start telling them this very story and they're like, you didn't get anything free out of that. They're like, get back down there. So I go back down there to talk to them after I do this. And so I, I go back down there and the security guys, I like, look anything that you want. So they had a restaurant on one floor that was like, the only thing on that floor was a restaurant. I remember just ordering food like crazy. I, I'm not even a big lobster fan. I order lobster just to eat it. I was ordering everything I could, but <laughs> that is awesome. Anyway, that is a crazy, crazy story, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, and by the way, pretty good cover for a guy, right? Like he's got the badge at a youth pastor, you know, like, Hey man, if there's ever been a cover, this guy probably dialed the Marriott for that weekend for the exact same reason. It's like, Hey, I could slide in and like, who's going to think a youth pastor, by the way, like, as we've known as faithful guys, like, man, you don't want to see a youth pastor hauled out with like cuffs, man. Like this is rumor mill, like, central right now like this is never going to be good you will never live in town it's like holy cow man that you know, i don't even share that story very often but if this was today in this day and age it would have been viral right it would oh, yeah. have been all over the place but this was in a day when you know there was no social media there was no cameras yeah you know, and carrying their big camcorder around like this you know yeah and you you know Later, of course, found to be nothing, 30, 40 minutes out of your life, but never to get a youth pastor job again because this video would be on YouTube somewhere and be like, oh, that, is that is that, that coverly guy? Yeah, That's right. Looking at our church could be a great pastor. Oh, no. 
we saw him get arrested in Philly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There was nothing like, but but guilty until proven innocent, right? That is it. So listen, oh. if anybody's watching this and they're like, I think he really did it. Listen, I, <laughs> I've you you can follow. That would be a long time of not living off some counterfeit money because yeah. uh, I've lived a pretty not extravagant life for a long yeah. time. Yeah. So. Well, we're we're all excited. You've got you know you've got a couple different companies. You got One Goal Productions, a nonprofit organization. It's unbelievable. Of course, you've got Kiner Enterprises, which has got the candies, the apparel, the events. Big event coming up, man. Kindnesswinscruises.com, right? Is it cruise? Kindnesswinscruise.com? Yep, kindnesswinscruise.com. So it's yeah, that's gonna... a cruise where we're inviting some huge social media influencers. I have Mama Todd on there who just won the Cheer of the Year Award. Cheer um, Choice. Yep, at the Cheer Choice Awards. We have Kevin Udi. We have Marcus Black. We have, oh man, we have Christian McCartney. He's a comedian. He won Comedian of the Year Award at the Cheer Choice Awards. I have this couple, the Hart Hardman family. They'll be sharing their story where their son, man, he gave up on the gift of life and they're 12 year old. And so oh. I'll be sharing their story. The purpose oh. of the cruise, the kindness wins cruise is because we want it to be fun. We want it to be engaging. We want there to be laughter because I truly believe laughter is the best medicine. We've heard that. And I witnessed that all the time, man. I witnessed yeah. hurting people laughing at a comedy magic show or some kind of comedy show. And so we want to be able to tackle some really hard issues. And the only way I know how to do it best is get people laughing, having a good time first, right? It has a way of breaking down the walls. And now we can seriously go, how do we tackle these issues that our kids are facing us? So kids are invited, parents are invited, and it's going to be a good time. So kindness wins cruise.com. People can reserve their cabin right now for only a hundred dollar deposit per person. And worry about the rest because it's not until March of 2025. So perfect. Yeah. I, man, I, you always hear it and I'm always staggered by the stats on as children, they laugh, smile, and it's like hundreds of times a day. Right. Yeah. And then I'm thinking, like, man, there are days I go through a whole day and I'm a, I'm a pretty good smile guy. I give them away all the time because I just think people need them. Right. And even when I don't feel like it, I'm very intentional about publicly, but privately, you know, I think I'm missing that, Tom. I mean, I am one of those stats like, like, man, I could go two days in my office and never get a good laugh. And I think that's probably one thing that's probably, I'm not a social media guy, man. Like, I, I mean, I'm on it, but I don't love it. Right. It's a time suck. And one of the things that I've tried to do, if I'm going to be there, I would like to see something that makes me laugh because it just, like you said, the endorphins, man, we know scientifically it's a big deal yep. from your perspective. And this is, you know, something for all you leaders out there, like vulnerability is a big deal mm. and laughter brings down the vulnerability wall, especially when we're laughing together. Right. And, you know, part of my best vulnerability is self-deprecation, right? Like everyone can laugh with me at me because I have done some really stupid stuff. Right. And it's pretty freaking funny, you know, and I appreciate that. Like nobody's perfect. Let me tell you a couple of dumb things. Right. And so I think that you know, people, people need to see that we're women. Right. And it's good. So I want I want I want to jump in a little bit about where where is your where's your primary audience? Where do people say, man, we've got to bring Tom in? This is a big deal because, man, I I, I see you as a as, as a corporate guy, obviously in in some hard areas like the prisons. I'll tell you a hard area, junior high. That's a freaking hard area, man. Yeah. So uh, I think I put prison and then seventh and eighth grade right below it. It's crazy, man. If you've ever been in the schools and worked in the schools, which I had a short stint as an educator, and I, and I have a degree in education, right? So, man, I I, tell, I don't tell the story to everybody, Tom. But uh, but when I was a kid, 
a you know, college guy, and now I'm nearing my degree and I can make money substitute teaching, I would answer the phone with this, yeah, Tom, what's that? Yeah. Oh, 11th grade? Yeah, sure, I'll be right down. Yeah, I'll be right there for today. <clears throat> yeah, hey, Tom, how you doing? Oh, eighth grade science got a really bad cold. I'm watching <laughs> I was like, I was literally working Oscars. I'm telling you, man. I was really like good. looking for awards because it. I had had some really tough experiences in like my first two months on the job at junior high. I thought, you know, the seventy one dollars or whatever, like the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's an age that I love, man. You ask what yeah. it's like. That's what's crazy, right? If I do elementary school assemblies, but that's not my. If I have any age that is not my biggest passion in the world, it's elementary school. But I do it, right? I've learned to be good at it. We have a elementary school program called Be a Hero and. But it's not really my talking style, right? Like if, yeah. if my talking style is very just real, raw, in your face, part of it's just Jersey upbringing, right? And yeah. teenagers and adults, they appreciate that style. Just be real with me, right? Just be raw with me. Well, if I talk that same way to little kids, little kids are like, he's yelling at us. No, I'm just talking yeah. with passion, right? And so yeah. – I have to like put on the Barney voice, like, "Hey, kids, don't." <laughs> yeah, you know? well, and that's right, and I and I love it. By the way, this is this is a mature adult taking an age appropriate uh, stance with his audience, and I just think that's good and right. You know, the thing that actually concerns me, Tom, nowadays, probably maybe one of the reasons we do homeschool is that. I feel like adults have forgot about discretion. Like, hey, I don't think this is a discussion for the second graders. Why are we having this? <laughs> like, and and I think the adults have to be adulting. So I really appreciate that, man. And it's hey, still a fabulous deal, but it's just not hey, where where I put my best show on. And man, when you talk about real raw, this seventh eighth grade is like life is getting real. Energy is at the upper level, and. The tough things are coming in at that age. And one of the things I really appreciate what you do is you leave kids behind with some tools in the tool belt. And at that age, I can recall having very few tools. I remember having awkward things go down. And then, well, I'm, I'm looking for a tool in the belt and I don't have one. Yeah, yeah. And then you're like, oh, man. What do you do? You know, hey, listen, you got a hammer and nail, and all you got is a toothbrush. I don't want your chances, man. Like, you know, so I got the wrong tools for the wrong events, and it feels awkward, and it feels crappy. And I really appreciate some of the kids and what they were going through. And after I saw it, I just had a lot of honor from flipping that around. And it, and it wasn't hard. It wasn't a great time for me at that age either. So I could appreciate how tough it is, but – I definitely thought like there was somebody more qualified than me to do with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a lot more patience than I do, Tom. So thank God that you're going in there. All right, yeah, no, I love it, man. I, I mean, I do. I do a lot of corporate events. And so, you know, I dress the part a little bit more. But when I'm doing my corporate events, man, I've, I've done a lot of huge, huge corporate events. And so that's a good chance to be able to do my comedy magic show. And even though they're there to have a good time, maybe they're having a dinner first and then I get up on stage and then I share just after I entertain them, like I'll take five minutes out of there so that people walk away, man, being better human beings walking through that exit doors than the ones they came in being right. And so that that's my goal with corporate events, but the middle school, high school, man, that's my love because they are facing things more than ever. And it's, most people, if you ask most adults, like what age of your life was besides adult life? Because I think adult, it gets hard, right? But yep. being a kid, like what was the hardest age? And everybody points back to middle school, man. Like yeah. middle school, like most people, right? That was the hardest years. It's one of the most cruel years. And part of it is because our bodies are developing at all different rates, right? And, yeah. and it seems like now more than ever, I mean, you have some elementary school kids that are in middle school that look like they're in elementary school still. They still look like they're third and fourth graders, some of them. 
And then you have some middle school kids, some of the ninth graders that look like they're 10th and 11th graders, right? And yeah. So, oh, yeah. When you have that range, bullying is just out of control. Then you put social media into the mix and cyberbullying and everything else. So our kids are facing stuff at all time highs, man. And so, yeah, to put the right tools in their hand is important more than ever. I mean, I've been speaking to teenagers for two decades plus. And so the youngest that I ever got contacted about Trent of a kid that unalived himself was 11 years old. And it stated that number for two decades until the pandemic pandemic happened. And ever since the pandemic, I've personally been contacted about a 10 year old, a nine year old, two, eight year olds, a seven year old and a six year old that ended their life, man. And so it's getting younger and younger because our kids are exposed to more and more. And so I just, that's why I named the school assembly destroy illusions. I want to destroy the illusions and lies. Our kids are believing about life, about themselves, about other people, but it's not enough to just destroy the illusions. We have to replace it with truth and reality, right? So for example, a kid that is like, man, no one would miss me if I'm gone. No one cares about me. Well, that's how we feel in the moment, right? You might be yes. in the moment. That's an illusion. That's a lie. Because truth and reality is even if you have a family that totally sucks and the not many people are like really there for you, like they should be there, right? Yeah. It's like you still have someone. I'm like, well, I'll usually ask a kid. You know, if I'm talking to them one on one after the assembly, like, man, who loves you the most? And they'll be like, oh, man, my grandma, you know, my yeah. grandma has always showed unconditional love. I'm like, well, truth is, your grandma would miss you, man. Like, then yeah. you need to stick around in this life for grandma right now, man. And well, I'll never have a purpose. You don't understand what I've done and, and the things that, like, I'll, I've been arrested and I can't do this or that. And I'm thinking, no, truth and reality is, man, you have a purpose in this life. Truth and yeah. reality is, you're not locked into your mistake, man. That mistake doesn't define you. You might have to deal with the consequences for a long time, but that's different than it defining you. Yeah. You are someone, man, that has a purpose. You are incredible. And I start just naming the things that they're, I ask them what they're good at, right? And so a lot of times those tools are just reminders, right? It's not earth shattering advice. I'm just communicating it in a raw and real way that kids can understand. But the same applies to adults. We all get wrapped into believing illusions and lies at times. And we just sometimes need a friend to come along and speak some truth and remind us of reality. And so that's what I get a chance to do when I'm speaking on stage. Yeah, I love it, man. And you know, the faith-based guy, I've had a lot of conversations with kids along the way, and especially because of the sports thing. We're in front of people all the time. And you know, and I and I'm and I'm beside myself with some of the stuff down on the social, you know, every every Saturday in the fall, you got 15 kids that missed a field goal, and every alumni is all ticked off telling these kids to go kill themselves and all that stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, are you serious about a freaking football game on a Saturday? Like, yeah, yeah. And, and, and like there wasn't something else that happened in the other 55 minutes of that entire game. Like, that couldn't have changed things. Like, it's such a joke. It's such a perspective that I can't get behind. It, it's very challenging for me that kids get grounded and realize that that is an illusion. Like, that's not who you are. Like, the press clippings, good and bad, do not have to define you. Yeah. And situations are temporary, man. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and, and 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 we all know this, by the way. And, and here's, here's the one that I, we see in our, fan, in, our, in our parents, kids. Like, have you ever seen your parents arguing, disagreeing? Yeah, I don't think, I think this is all trash. Families, it's... Hey, Alex, Trent, how you doing? <laughs> it's like 180 in like five seconds. My dad was all picked off 14 seconds ago. And now all of a sudden he's Mr. Hospitable, right? Yeah, yeah. We can change our situations very quickly. And, and, and I can go from a, from, a, from a funeral to Craig's Cruisers and be laughing with my child in, in 30 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. And the situations change. And it's not like I'm unhappy. The thing I really challenge with kids is like, man, 
God gives us a lot of strengths and we all have them. And I want every person in the world to go find it and, and show out for the world what you have, because that's what you were put here for. Like, it's incredible. And God doesn't make any mistakes, man. Nope. You were born perfect. I was like, you know what? My left leg's three three inches shorter. I got to walk with this. You were made perfect. There's a purpose for this, man. Like, no mistakes were made. They were never made. It's going to come to light, but you got to play it out. Like, you got to walk the walk and own it. Like, this yeah. is part of who I am. And, exactly. and, and, and I want, I just want to, I want kids and people to lean in to why they're different. It makes them uniquely you. Like no one else can be you. Like You're that. perfect the yeah. way you are. And there's a reason. And uh, man, and it's really hard. It's really hard for folks to understand those things because we all got things about ourselves we don't like. And I'll tell you the, the biggest evil to me, Tom, is the comparison game. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. On. Right. Yep. You know, Cause that starts the illusion. Well, you know, I wish, I wish I was as funny as Tom. Tom just goes up there and rocks the audience. You and I were on the TEDx stage together. And I'm like, man, I, I sure wish I hope I, I hope I hit the audience. Cause Tom really hit the audience. You know, like, and you're like, the comparison game is not the game we're playing. It, it's, like, it's destroying people. And our kids are seeing that comparison game on social media, man. Yeah. All the time. Right. It's, it's something that I start off my assemblies talking about that. I bring two magazines up on stage. I bring a fitness magazine and a beauty magazine. Yeah. And I talk about the illusion and lie that there are many people, not just kids, the adults that have believed the illusion and lie that if somehow you don't look like the cover of a magazine, then somehow you're not good enough or you're not perfect enough or you're not beautiful yeah. enough. And yeah. that's a lie. And I get a chance to remind them a the truth and reality that nobody looks like that. No one looks like, the cover of that magazine. Sure, this dude might have some abs and he might be in good shape and yeah. this girl might be beautiful, but there are things about them that they would love to change if you got oh. into them. And we all know how much photo editing goes into yeah. those images. And that's where I talk to kids. I mean, we're so used to taking our cell phones, right? And we can snap one, two, three, four pictures before we upload it to social media. These kids and adults, right? And one or two clicks, we can make pictures, quote unquote, look better. And yeah. Could you imagine a professional team of people taking thousands of pictures of you? And then eventually you're going to find the right side of Trent and Tom Coverley, right? You're going to find a good yeah. side. You're taking a thousand. Really good. Really good. Really good. Really good. <laughs> and then a, a professional team editing that and I share the story how I did a red carpet event and I met Cindy Crawford and I was talking to Cindy Crawford about my school assembly, destroy illusions. And she said, Tom, I believe every single one of those illusions and lies. And she talked about how she she's known for making this statement, but it was amazing to hear this right from her mouth in more context to be able to say, Tom, she said, I wish I looked like Cindy Crawford. Think about that. You have one of the most famous supermodels that wishes that she looked like the cover of her magazines because yeah. she knows. And she was like, Tom, I'm in the studio all day long. Thousands of pictures taken of me, and an entire team of people editing that before people would ever see it on the newsstands. And so no wonder, Trent, we have so many people in our nation, man, that are believing the illusion and lie that this is perfection. Anything else below this somehow doesn't measure, measure up. Yeah. That's why eating disorders among our young people um, is out of control. That's why kids who are cutting themselves is out of control. Kids who are deciding that giving up on this gift of life is somehow an option rather than living this life out because they're basing the way that they feel based on a lie, an illusion, right? This, that magazine, instead of reality and truth that they're perfect the way that they are, they don't have to change for anything. I'm no. a faith based guy too, right? I'm like, God is a huge part of my life. I don't share that in the schools and I don't, I just speak real, but I would love to tell them, right? Like you are perfect. God, you said it, God made no mistakes. Right. And, yeah. and, but I say it in other ways on stage, you know, I just, when I'm yeah. in a public school setting, I'm but. And I'm concerned. I'm concerned for the youth of America. I'm like, you know, hey, I, religion, diet, you know, what, whatever you choose to believe. Like, I'm concerned that we're pulling a higher power out of that because, you know, when there's something greater than ourselves to focus on, you know, 
we take me out of it, right? And and in our culture, we're like, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me, you know, and it's me, me, I, I. That is a dangerous ground to work on anyway, right? And and I think, you know, coming from the sports aspect now of the the idols of parents that are putting it into their 13 year old little leaguer. Cause you know, he's dominating the travel program. And you know, like, like, are you serious? Right now? How many people come to me, Tom and go, man, you know, we, we just, we just think little Jake's going to be a big leaguer. And I'm like, Hey, hey bro, he's eight. Like, I mean, and, and, and by the way, as, as people who face a ton of adversity, I will tell them careful what you wish for. You talk to a lot of people who've been through pro sports. It's everything they ever wanted, everything they ever desired. And then they get there and find out it's hard. It's filled with temptation. You will be scrutinized at every single second and compared to everybody. You don't want to play the comparison game. And the moment they do, they go, well, this is what Tom Coverley's contract worked, and this is what Trent Carson's worked. And Ryan, we don't think you're as good as those two are because they do this better, and it's compares, compares, compares. And it's like, wow. I don't measure up. I, I tell people a lot in talks, man. When I was coming up, I heard you're not big enough. You're not strong enough. You're not fast enough. And, man, my voice inside my mind started saying, Trent, you're not enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just because I wanted this so much, right, and and – and the, the people that were telling me they weren't doing this out of like spite. They weren't trying. They were they they cared about me, right? Yeah. They did. And it was like, hey man, like it's like a fraction of one percent naked. Like you've got to have a black a backup plan. Right? Yeah. Like, you know, what's the plan B, Clark? Right? Yeah. And and I'm like, yeah, no plan B, man. I gotta go. And so, but those words matter. And man, I I had a great woman who was the the number one u.s record holder in the steeplechase and the she came on my show yep in the and one the steeplechase run yeah she played at the, she ran at the university of nebraska and she's featured in the book and and she was like wow like how are you talking to yourself? Because you and I are good friends, Tom. And like when I talk to Tom Coverley, man, I love me some Tom Coverley, right? And and I speak to Tom with admiration, respect for all the work he's doing. I would never say an ill will word to Tom Coverley, but I would say many ill will words to Trent Clark inside my head. Right? I mean, how messed up is that? Like, and, and not, that's not a knock against Tom Coverley. Like, I just out of respect wouldn't do it. But I'm not respecting myself enough to do it. That's an error on my part. Yo, you, you nailed exactly what I talk about in the schools. That I talk about respecting yourself first. That's why I start off with the magazine talk, right? And yeah. So, because I truly believe in most cases, you can't respect other people until you learn the respect to yourself, right? We Amen. can't speak through it because I do it too, right? Exactly what you said. I could tell people truth, 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 reality, reality, rea reality all day long about you. But then I look in the mirror, right? And believe some illusions and lies. And so it, it's, it is, man. It's a constant, constant battle of trying to overcome, right? And so I you know, face that back when I was in college, I had a professor, man. And of course, at that point, I thought, oh, I'll be a youth pastor, right? And that's what, how I'll work with teenagers. And I'll probably die being a youth pastor, right? I thought that's what I would do forever. And so, but I had a professor in one of my speech classes, and he was like, pulled me to the side. And he said, maybe you should, he was trying to do that conversation, like you talked about, maybe you should do something over here. Because yeah. He's basically trying to say, look, you're not a great speaker. You stutter over your words. And bro, when I would get nervous, I would stutter, man, like really bad getting up in front of people. I would shake really bad. Like if I had something in my hand, I'm like talking like this. And so, <laughs> yeah, I love it. so I was just like, oh man, I knew I stunk at it. But to hear that, boom, that just hit the heart bad. Yeah. Right? And it just yeah. crossed my dream of wanting to stand on stages and speak to young people 
and take my story, man, and just encourage them to overcome and, and be something. And so I, I didn't have the internet, man. It, you know, it was 1991, man. So I didn't have the internet to go looking up how to be a good speaker. So for a guy that doesn't like to read, I forced myself to get into the library, read every book I could on public speaking, everything I could on being a good speaker. I took every opportunity. I remember like calling nursing homes going, can I stand, you know, in front of everybody and like, and just speak this message that I've been working on. Oh yeah, sure. And like grandpa's over there snoring away, you know, and like, but it was experience, man. Yeah. I like, I'll do it for nothing. I was like, when that professor told me it put something inside of me where I said, I am going to be, this was my goal back then. And not in any arrogant way. It was, I want to be the best speaker on this campus. I'm going to prove this guy wrong, this professor wrong, that I can do this. And so start going to like speech, clap, like when I get nervous, how that with the stutter, just all of that stuff, man. Yeah. And just like, this is what I want to do. And so that that's how it all began, man. And overcoming that. And you know, man, in our life, we all have, like you said, we all have things that we deal with, man. People go and see people up on stage and like, man, I want that, like you talked about. But behind the scenes, man, like life gets hard. We're all in this journey of life together. And it's tough, right? It just, think of a roller coaster, man. And like, you got this roller coaster ride, very, there's only maybe one or two times you're at the very top, right? Maybe one on most roller coasters, right? Yeah. And so that top mountaintop experience where you get to see in full view of what everything looks like and comes together, you only experience that once and then the rest of the ride is that. And I believe that is life, man. We have too many people, man, that it look for the mountaintop experiences to be happy. Or my wife's a marathon runner and an ultra marathon runner. And so wow. like, she, you know is training so that she can cross that finish line in a good time, right? And most people are like, they wait till the finish line or the mountaintop to feel happy or to go, that's when I'll get it together. Yeah. And if that's the only time you're happy, we're going to spend most of the time in this life pretty miserable. You yeah. have to learn. My biggest thing I say all the time is enjoy the journey. You have to learn to enjoy the journey. Enjoying the journey when someone in your family dies or whatever doesn't mean like yeah i'm enjoying this journey but you find something man find the blessings out of life still because what happens is we can quickly start to focus on the negative instead of the positive the blessings that are happening and when we begin to do that man we'll begin um, to overcome so many more things in our life yeah, I think it's very easy to get into the imposter syndrome, you know, and, and I think part of your vulnerability and, and mine too, is to tell people like, hey, well, we're training this up and learning together and we're coming alongside and growing together. It's very important, yeah. right? But I want to say like, I'm dealing with the same things you are. I'm talking about it and that's important right but at the end of the day i'm i'm challenged with the same issues you are we aren't any different here like i i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna jump into the comparison boat i'm gonna forget how valuable i am as a prince as a son of a king like there are all sorts of things i'm gonna forget in that moment and man i i am so anti-victim right the victim mentality Yet, I'm a guy who can climb into that role pretty quick. You know, I've been notorious, like, you know, big bottom lip. You know, Tom, yeah. Yeah. referee's just not calling it my way, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. But I would say, you know, when you talk about enjoying the journey, right? Let's just jump right there. Like we have trials, we have temptations, and we want to enjoy the things we've earned, you know, and in my TED talk about the two pains of discipline, check it out because it's such a it's such a thing. We're gonna have pain in this life. And trials and and temptations, James two, James one two. Consider it pure joy, mm. my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know 
that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Mm. And that's not our go-to, right? And I'm coming from the funeral of my favorite uncle. How can I consider this pure joy? Yeah. Now we're talking gap and gain, right? Um, yep. The gain is, man, you had 23 years of your life with your favorite uncle on memories you're never going to forget. Like, get the gain, not the gap of, man, I lost. 12 years of high quality time with my uncle because he died early. That's the gap. You're going to focus on the gap. you got to come into the game. And there's a reason these things are happening. And, and it's, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be sad. It does not mean you shouldn't mourn. It just means you're being shaped and be okay with the journey because, man, when I look at it, you know, we always talk about learning, Tom. You know, when we win, we go check out the tape real quick and, oh, yeah, yeah, we won. When we lose, we check out the tape for three hours, right? Yeah, yeah. Like it hurts and you're not feeling great and you're not enjoying the journey right now. So now it's like, hey, man, we need to get shaped. We need to get polished. We need to get figure this out because this isn't fun. And how are we going to figure this journey out? But we don't have those moments. And it's hard as a parent. It's hard as a homeschool parent because I want kids to get the lessons and we're in a helicopter parent age, right? Where kids don't face adversity and we don't let them work through a solution. And then they're 26 years old going, hey, dad, I don't, I don't know how I can face anything. Yeah. Like, well, all right, that's right. I never let you learn. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm i guilty. Guilty as charged, man. Like, I've been that guy before. And it's a tough, it's a tough, tough deal. What do you tell people that are going through adversity. Because, Tom, right now, man, it's tough. Like, a lot of people think, like, oh, man, things are going good, blah, blah. And then, like, man, you see some economic downturn. There are people that have been where both you and I have been facing adversity. What would you tell somebody today in that age category that is facing a trial and a temptation today and on that journey that it's not perfect? It's not the way they want it to be. Yeah. Simply remind yourself of reality. You have to. You have to. Every time you hear a or you're thinking an illusion and lie in your head, literally, I encourage people to say out loud the opposite of that, right? The reality, the truth of that, or the focus on that blessing. Because we can think stuff in our head, but there's something powerful about hearing our voice, right? Of saying it out loud, man. Like, so. If it's, you know, financially, man, I'm just not going to make it. I'm sinking. Like, bro, I spent three months bedridden this past winter. I, I couldn't move. I couldn't get up to walk to here to that door over there, man. And so I was just, I had something, an infection that went all throughout my whole body, man. And just, so I couldn't do events. It put us behind financially. I remember just, you know, I'm still saying it months later sometimes of going, we're sinking. We're sinking financially, right? That's an illusion and a lie, right? I mean, the reality is we might be going down, right? Bills might be tight and finances yeah. might be looking like this. But truth and reality is I need to say out loud that I am going to make it. I've climbed out of harder times before. I've lived off a whole lot less. Reality is if I got to go sell my Jeep out there, I'll go sell my Jeep. If I got to sell this apartment, get a smaller apartment, whatever it is, right? We can, we, we, we fool ourselves and we lie to ourselves all the time. And so truth and reality is, is key to anything. And I tell people, even when you're listening to other people, right? We all have friends that vent to us, right? And we have friends that we vent to. And so you don't have to be some fancy counselor or have a fancy counselor degree to be able to listen to someone because most people just want us to listen, right? And you yes. listen. And if you listen good enough, you're going to hear someone say some illusions and lies that they're believing. So after they're done talking, after you listen, your response, if you do want to respond, you know, just echo back some truths and reality that counter the things that they said, because it's not earth shattering to them. They already know that truth and reality. It's just right now they're, they forgot about it. Right. And so yeah. just remind them of that. You know, two things I ask people as a listener, first of all, to your pro tip right here is if you're going to be a listener, a great statement is tell me more about, mm -hmm. um, tell me more about kinder candy. Tell me more about the infection. Tell me more about how the nurses treated you. Tell me more about how you got back on your feet. Tell me more what you're doing about the finances. As you see people hurting, you know, lean into the hurt and tell me more, walk them through it. Listen, 
not not give solution. Yep. Listen, and if they stop talking, Tom, and what else? Oh, and I had this great doctor. He was incredible for me. You know, he really started getting me in the right direction. Oh, and what else? Oh, and you know what? The bookings came back. We rescheduled. I got things going. Right. So the other thing I will ask, and I like to throw in when I'm listening. So what I heard you say was, Tom, that, hey, you had this infection. Let people know, hey, I'm engaged with you, and I don't, I don't need to provide a solution for you. I just want to be an ear to listen to. And you will create way better relationships in your life if you can get these three questions right. And one of the things as a coach I ask a lot is, Tom, you just told me, you know, this guy said I am a piece of garbage. Yeah. And – Tom, is that true? Just tell me tell me if you believe that's true. Mm-hmm. Well, no, it's not true. You know it's not true. You know I'm a good guy. But like, when people say that, that hurts my feelings. And you know, I don't want other people thinking that. But is it true? Because mm-hmm. you know it's an illusion. Like, tell me, is it true? And when you really get down to it, they know it's not true. Exactly. And yet you got to get snapped out of it. Like, listen, man, you want to keep running this thing down your head that, oh, what someone's going to think about you and believe because someone told a lie. And that. Listen, if you know in your heart it's not true, we got to start there. Mm-hmm. If it's true in your heart, then we got to well, remedy, repent, get back to work, get, get working. Yeah. Right? yeah. But nine out of 10, man, it's not true. It's true. Right. All of questions are huge. I encourage people all the time, Trent, to, you know, ask follow up questions when it comes to people's mental health. Right. It doesn't matter if you're pumping the gas. It doesn't matter if you're standing in line. We all ask complete strangers sometimes. Hey, how you doing? And what's the typical answer? I'm fine. I'm OK. I'm all right. And yeah. then I encourage people to ask a follow up question. You know, if you got time and you're staying in line and you truly care and we're going to make kindness the norm in this world, then we've got to start asking some follow up questions. And I encourage people to ask this. If someone if I'm like, Trent, hey, man, how you doing? And you're you, you're like, man, I'm OK. Then I will ask you, hey, can I ask you another question, man? Like, how are you really doing, man? You said, OK, but how are you really doing? You'll be amazed at how many complete strangers I'm pumping gas and I made this a habit and people will start to open up to you, man. Yeah. Man, I'm going through a divorce right now, man. It's tough. Like, and they just start pouring their heart out or man, I, I'm my finances, man. I just lost my job, man. And just because people want people to just listen, man. And so yeah. those follow-up questions are huge. So that's a big thing that I ask people all the time. When you hear someone, okay, I'm fine. I'm doing all right. Ask them, can I ask you another question? How are you really doing? I love that. I love that. I think it's so critical. I, I, I would, I lean into another question to finish this. You know, it's hard. We're busy people. I love listening. Get a good three, four minutes. It can add value in somebody's life yeah. and, and make their day. And I'll ask, hey, let me ask you one more question. If, if things were wonderful, hey, walk me through how that would look. Mm. Oh, man. I, I'd, be, I'd be nice to my wife every day. I'd come home. She can't wait for me to be there. And I'm like, what do you think that would take? Because let's, let's start doing those things. Yeah. What it right? takes. Yep. Yeah. Let's start doing those things because you can make wonderful happen. You can get into action and you can do it. And you know what, man? I tell a lot of people that are down, go, go mow your neighbor's lawn. Mm. Go get the woman down the street. The widow, she's 86 years old. Go out, just mow her lawn. Yeah, because yeah. you cannot feel bad about yourself when you're helping someone else. So true. Yeah, I always say all the time, you will never lay your head on the pillow at night and go, man, I regret being nice to that person. I, I regret mowing that little old lady's lawn. Yeah. Or, oh, man, like I handled that situation really good. I can't believe I did that. No, but you always have regret when you lay your head on the pillow and you're like, man, I overreacted in that situation. Or, man, I shouldn't have said those things out of my mouth to my boss or to my wife or to my husband or wh- whoever, right? It's just we always have regret when we choose negative. But when we choose to do the right thing, we choose kindness because kindness wins, right? So Love that's it. That's my encouragement, man. That's awesome. We just find a way with Tom Coverley. Tom, so good to have you, man. Thanks for for everybody here, check 
out. Kindnesswinscruise.com. You can find Tom all over the internet at Kindness Wins. His name, TomCoverly.com. Got to go check this man out. Book him. You are not going to be disappointed. Bring this guy in. You know, you want, I think more than ever, people want to lift the spirits of their people, have them enjoy one another, learn how to interact with love and happiness and joy. And that is what Tom is going to bring to your organization. You, this is a can't miss kid right here. So for everybody out there, man, Tom, cover me. Bring in the noise. Thanks, buddy. Yo, thanks. Wake up, be calm, repeat. Love it. For everybody, Winners Find a Way show, thank you for joining us every Friday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern, 9.30 a.m. Pacific. Join us here. And until next time, winners, find a way. That's it.